me at the end. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. I'm not going to do it. All right. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dean Amani Jamal, and it is my honor to welcome you to today to, to today's panel discussion on the issue of criminal justice reform. Specifically, this discussion will focus on how government can help bring more justice and equity to our nation's criminal legal system. This is a very, very timely conversation. The recent midterm election featured heated debates and all too often fear-mongering tactics on issues of crime and safety. Two months ago, President Biden used his clemency powers to try to improve the criminal justice system by pardoning people convicted of federal marijuana possession offenses. And just last week, Governor Kate Brown of Oregon, who is here with us today, used her clemency powers. <laughs> used her clemency powers to help more than 45,000 people living with a marijuana record, serving as a model for other governors across the nation. These actions are welcome news, and it's not just about focusing on marijuana legislation. There are many issues that need to be addressed within the criminal, criminal justice, justice system. As many of you know, the United States has the distinction of being the world's largest incarcerator. We put more people in jails and prisons than any other nation in the world. And only recently did we move from first to fifth place in the global ranking of imprisonment rates right between Cuba and Panama. The problem of mass incarceration is a racial justice issue at its core. With black and brown communities disproportionately arrested and incarcerated and treated more punitively by the criminal justice system. It would be easy to feel despair on this issue, but as we will, as will be discussed today, the past several years have featured some innovative solutions to move the nation in a new direction. Blue, purple, and red states are experimenting with new policy solutions and moving towards a system where incarceration is a last resort rather than a reflexive hammer. There is a rethinking of decades of failed policies and a recognition on both the right and the left that there are too many people in prison who are serving unjust sentences, and that we need to do something about this as a nation. To help address some of the societal inequities in our state, Princeton is proud to have launched the SPIA New Jersey initiative this year. And we are so honored to have the Attorney, Attorney General of the state, Matt Platkin, here with us today. New Jersey has been a national leader in finding policy solutions to the problem of mass incarceration. And SPIA is proud to facilitate this conversation today about this important topic. We're also working towards putting together a criminal justice program here at Princeton. It is within this context that I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to today's panel. This event is co-sponsored co by our friends at the American Civil Liberties Union and we have with us a talented array of policymakers and advocates who are engaged in innovative work to try to find new ways to bring equity to our criminal justice system. Now I want to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Udi Ofer, is the James Weinberg Visiting Professor here at Princeton SPIA and the founding director of our new policy advocacy clinic. Udi recently left the ACLU after 20 years where he led the organization's criminal justice reform advocacy efforts and served as its deputy national political director. Udi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna start here um, just with a few quick opening remarks to introduce everyone and then I will sit down. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dean Jamal. It has been such an honor to be here at SPIA um, over the last several, well, I've been here since 2018, but full time um, over the last few months. It's such a welcoming community to innovative and bold policy thinking, including on the issue that brings us here today. 
as, Jean, as Dean Jamal recognized, this is such a timely conversation, right? We're here with Governor Brown, who you're like, you're a national hero here in this room and, and to many communities across the country, um, um, who, as you'll hear repeatedly today, um, just uses her executive power of clemency to pardon more than 47,000 people. And President Biden just acted earlier this year also using his clemency power. Um, and it may feel like an anomaly, right? It may feel like this is an extraordinary thing, which it is, but when you look at American history, it actually isn't. We have a long tradition in the United States that most people do not know about of governors and presidents using their clemency power to try to fix systemic injustices. And it literally dates back to the founding of this nation. President George Washington pardoned the people who were involved in the Whiskey uh, Rebellion of 1794. Why? Because he wanted to heal a nation. He wanted to bring people together, so he pardoned them. President John Adams pardoned Pennsylvanians who were engaged in insurrection. President Jefferson, the list goes on and on and on. President Lincoln, after the Civil War, used his clemency power to try to heal a nation. Even in the 20th century, we saw presidents use their clemency powers. President Roosevelt pardoned people who were convicted under the Espionage Act. And it's always been a bipartisan issue. President Ford pardoned the records of tens of thousands of people who had evaded the Vietnam War um, um, draft or had deserted the military. Again, why? Because he wanted to heal a nation. And most recently, again, governors on the right, conservative governors, including Governor Kevin Stitt, Republican who represents Oklahoma, one of the most conservative states in the nation, uses clemency power to commute, which means he reduced the sentences and released from prison 527 people who were incarcerated for drug possession. Now, 527 may not sound like a, a large number, but it was 2% of the state prison population that he used his power of commutation to commute. But something began to happen in the, in the 1970s, in 1980s, and 1990s that made clemency a bad thing, quote unquote. And that is the rise of mass incarceration. And that is the rise of tough on crime politics. And suddenly governors became fearful, and presidents became fearful, understandably so, of being um, labeled as soft on crime and realizing that the politics were changing on the issue and clemency became unpopular except for those one-off occasions when someone who was really well connected was able to get the mercy of the president or the mercy of the governor. So I would argue, and I think this panel today would argue, that in the same way that President Washington, George Washington, in the same way that President Lincoln, in the same way that President Ford, use clemency as a way to heal a nation, we need our governors and we need our president today to use their clemency powers to heal a nation that has been ravaged by a war on drugs, that has been ravaged by a crisis of mass incarceration. And, the, and part of the healing process, part of us coming together as a nation is through the power of clemency. So I'm honored today to have this incredible panel who are changing changing policy in America, and changing the way we think about this issue. So I'm going to quickly introduce everyone, and then you will hear from our guests. Governor Brown is the 38th governor of the great state of Oregon, and I mean that. I have family in Oregon. <laughs> um, she has been, my mother-in-law went to University of Oregon, no, Oregon State. Hey, Oregon, Oregon State, State. State. Sorry. Oh, that was terrible. That was terrible. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> My partner went to Lewis and Clark, um, but she's been governor since 2015. Before becoming governor, she served three terms in the Oregon House of Representatives, three terms as a state senator, and two terms of the, as the Oregon Secretary of State. She has been and continues to be a trailblazer. I'm going to introduce everyone and then have individual questions. She was the first openly LGBT person to be elected Secretary of State, and she was the first openly LGBT person in the nation to be elected as a governor. And, that, and as you're going to hear tonight, she's also been a trailblazer on the issues of clemency and criminal justice reform. Um, according to an article by The Guardian, and the author is right here with us, 
Governor Kay Brown has granted more commutations or pardons than all of Oregon's governors combined over the last 50 years, which is an incredible accomplishment. We also have Michael Thompson here with us. Uh, Mr. Thompson spent over 25 years in Michigan prison for the sale of marijuana until he was granted a commutation by Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, putting an end to, the, to his draconian 42 to 60 year sentence. He was released on January 28, 2021, and literally did not skip a beat to say exactly what his life is going to be about. He came out to the awaiting press and said, literally, quote, enough is enough, and has dedicated his life to ending mass incarceration in the United States. Mr. Thompson founded the Michael Thompson Clemency Project, which is fighting every day to end mass incarceration and to fight against racial injustices in the criminal legal system. And Matt Placken is the 62nd Attorney General of the great state of New Jersey, and I genuinely mean that. <laughs> <laughs> Where he has made criminal justice reform a priority. Before becoming Attorney General, Mr. Placken served as Chief Counsel to Governor Murphy, who has also been a trailblazer on issues of criminal justice reform. He has also served as Senator Cory Booker's Special Counsel during the first impeachment of Donald Trump. And Senator Cory Booker has also been, I mean, New Jersey literally is blessed. And a lot of it is because of the work of organizations like the ACLU of New Jersey, which has been doing incredible work on issues of criminal justice reform. But New Jersey has been blessed with policymakers who are national leaders on the state level, on the federal level, on issues of criminal justice reform. I've had many conversations with Mr. Plotkin on this issue, and I know he's incredibly committed to criminal justice reform. Um, and we welcome him here today. Okay, so I'm going to pose the first question to Governor Brown, and then I'm going to sit down, or you could, okay. Well, let me sit down and pose it. Okay. Because I don't want, you know, I don't want everyone to have to feel like they have to stand up. But Governor Brown, so we've been talking about how President Biden recently made national news um, um, using his clemency po uh, powers to pardon about 6,500 people. Then last week, he took it up a notch. <laughs> and he said 6,500? What is that? And you used your clemency powers to, to pardon the, the marijuana records of 47,144 people. And you went even further. You then also um, forgave $14 million in, 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 in fee forgiveness, which a lot of people forget that once incarceration is done, it doesn't mean that your life of entanglement in the system is done. So can you walk us through that decision and why you made it? Sure. And good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm truly honored to be here and very honored to be on this panel with my esteemed colleagues. We are truly a nation of second chances. And I have to applaud President Biden for taking the courageous leadership that he took in pardoning over 6,000 folks. He understands, as I think everyone in this room understands, that our criminal justice system is flawed, it's inequitable, and it's certainly outdated. I absolutely believe that no one, no one deserves to be forever saddled with the impacts of a conviction for simple possession of marijuana, when in Oregon it is a crime that is no longer on the books. And certainly we know folks that have faced housing barriers, employment barriers, educational barriers uh, for uh, the conviction of this particular crime. And obviously, at least in my state, it's completely legal and has been for a number of years. And while people across the country in terms of races use marijuana at similar rates, I think we all know the truth, and that is that people of color, our low-income community members, have been disproportionately impacted uh, by these crimes. And so for me, this is very much a racial justice issue. Um, these pardons and remissions were part of, the, of one piece of my broad work regarding clemency. We are really focused on three areas, but I also like the, the healing. How do we move our country forward? Um, for me, this is truly uh, using a uh, governor's executive power to grant clemency is truly an act of mercy 
it is um, incredibly useful tool to correct injustices uh, in my state and in this country. And of course, uh, I think it is an underutilized tool to enhance rehabilitation. And what I mean by that is I've released a number of folks who were incarcerated uh, for drug offenses who were using, and I've released them early uh, so that they could get into, the treat into treatment, so they could get the medical support and services that they desperately needed and were denied when they were behind bars. So this is the work we're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm just so thrilled and excited to be here with all of you today, and I look forward to hearing more of this conversation. Thank you so much, Governor Brown. Mr. Thompson, um, you were incarcerated for an unmanageable, unmanageable 25 years for a marijuana-related charge. You see many of my students here today, and that is longer than many of their lives. Just to give you a sense of how long, give the crowd a sense. But, you know, I know it's always asking a lot, but you've dedicated your life now to bringing awareness of this issue. But can you tell us about your experience, and can you walk us back to that moment when you learned you had received a commutation? Uh, I knew this was going to happen. I knew it. But anyway, let's see. Anyway, I just don't. I don't like to revisit. It happened for me. My main focus is I just want to get others free. Like I got free. And uh, when I uh, heard about uh, I'm going to get released, I didn't believe it because they're playing so many politics. One minute they're going to do something, next minute they didn't. So I didn't pay him no attention to his attorney named uh, Kim Carrera. She called me and told me that it's over. You know, That's the reason I want, I want other guys to feel what I feel. Feel the freedom that I feel. Because if it wasn't for people like Sean King, Last Prison Project, Anna, who wrote the Rolling Stones, and all these celebrities like Snoop Dogg and what about the people that don't have all these bagging that I had? I just, I just can't tell you how I felt. And I just want to see others walk out that gate the same way I walked out. Now I know what they're feeling because I felt it. I just want everyone to understand everybody in prison is not bad. They got some good ones in there. So what you're going to do, put them in a basket with the rest of them? You can't just keep throwing away a human being. You know, you got them in the, underneath these trap sentences, like you had me. I didn't supposed to get out of prison to 2038. But look at me, because people that showed humanity, 
and had hearts and conscience that are conscious. Some people don't have no conscience, they just strictly political. They quickly, I mean, they quit, they only think about their careers and stuff like that. But what about a human life? What about their family? So I just want to end. I know I'm speaking longer than I'm supposed to speak, but it's okay. But it's just I just want you to know I just want you to know the pain that a family go through. Because I lost my family. Everybody don't have to lose theirs. I don't know my family anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Attorney General Plotkin, um, I've had, like I've said, I've had many conversations with you on this issue, and I know that you see the humanity of this issue. It is not just about politics for you. And your office has been engaged in some really creative innovations on criminal justice reform. For example, earlier this year, you announced the creation of a new division with your office, the Division of Violence Intervention and Victim Assistance, VIVA. So can you talk a bit about what's your hope um, with this division? What do you hope it will accomplish? And how do you see it um, adding to the existing work of your office? Um, sure. First of all, uh, Dean, I don't know if she went, thank you for hosting this. And Udi, thank you for having me. And um, Governor, it's a privilege to be here with you. And Michael, uh, thank you for, for sharing your story. Um, no, I haven't been a career I haven't been an AG as my career, uh, but I, I was in private practice for a period of time and uh, represented three different individuals who we got out of custody and, and several that we were unsuccessful. And um, I was always amazed by their bravery. Uh, you know, I, I brought one of my clients home to his family. I, that moment's always stuck with me. Um, but you to be able to so quickly after, you know, just listening to your sentence, we have some issues here, but we would never have a sentence that long. We can talk about some of the things we've done to prevent that for the um, conduct that you were alleged to have done. Um, the fact that you've, after, you know, dealt with that injustice and are here now, and frankly, I'm sure in many rooms like this all over the country, um, advocating on this issue is incredibly powerful and something that I can't say I would be able to do if I were in your shoes. So give you a tremendous amount of credit. Um, you know, I'm privileged to serve in this role in a state where, Udi, as you, you mentioned, where we have so many people rowing in the same direction. Um, and there's a number of uh, folks here from the ACLU of New Jersey. There aren't that many AGs in the country who um, are at the same table as the ACLU outside of the context of litigation. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes that happens to us too. I don't want to pretend Alex is here. I would be misleading if I said otherwise. But um, we have a great partnership here. And it's an incredible partnership that we have across advocates. And ACLU New Jersey has been at the forefront here, not just uh, as litigators, but as policymakers. Um, and it's spanned administrations. So I've inherited work that was done by attorneys general who served in, in Chris Christie's administration and in um, John Corzine's administration and Governor Whitman's administration. And so it's, it's a legacy that I'm very proud of. Um, but one of the things that we've been building on here is as the chief law enforcement officer, um, and you talked about, um, you know, trying to um, uh, Governor, you know, you said the right words about decency and, and um, compassion. Um, uh, we've tried to infuse a victim 
centric trauma informed approach across the work we do. I have the broadest jurisdiction just about of any attorney general in the country in that I have complete criminal jurisdiction, 38,000 sworn officers report in some way or shape or form up to me. We have no elected prosecutors here. They all report up to me. Um, uh, and I also have very broad civil authority. And so we've tried to ensure that all of our work uh, is, is infused with a trauma-informed and victim-centric viewpoint. Um, because that's, I believe, how we protect the public best. I mean, my department is called the law, Department of Law and Public Safety. Public safety is literally in our name, but public safety is broader than just how many uh, tickets are we issuing and, and arrests are we making. And so this division that we stood up that's now on par with our state police, with our Division of Criminal Justice, which is our state prosecution agency, is meant to focus on that. And um, a big piece of that work is our work on violence intervention, which I'm very proud our governor has been a tremendous supporter of state legislature. We've put tens of millions of dollars just over the past couple of years to work supporting organizations on the ground. And I was just with two different ones today um, that have credibility with communities that have frankly been ignored by law enforcement. Up just a few years ago, we weren't funding organizations on the ground that have been doing this work for decades. And what Essentially, what we ask them to do is partner with us and be those credible messengers. And some people are uncomfortable with this because to be a credible messenger, you have to have credibility. And a lot of folks who have credibility in communities that I think in some cases rightfully have distrust of law enforcement themselves have criminal histories. And so we as a law enforcement agency are now supporting those organizations and have brought them into our work because I believe whether it's violent crime uh, certainly violent crime, you're not going to enforce your way out of the problem. It's a piece of the puzzle. And I say that as the chief law enforcement officer, but if that's your entire solution, then we're never going to resolve, whether it be the epidemic of gun violence or whatever we're talking about. And so I believe that this division is part of a broader effort we've made, and we could talk about some of those other efforts here to reform our criminal justice system and reduce the reliance on an overly punitive approach to law enforcement. Thank you. So both um, Dean Jamal and Mr. Thompson um, mentioned politics. You're our elected official here, Governor Brown. I didn't know the Attorney General was not elected. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was going to be two of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so look, we just came out of, oh my God, I, I don't know, certainly in my lifetime, I don't remember or at least my adult lifetime, such a heated election, such a quote-unquote tough on crime election, and the one we just came out of um, in the midterm. It's fair to say that not since the height of mass incarceration have we seen tough on crime politics take such a hold, including in the great state of Oregon, right, where it became a major topic during the gubernatorial election. So can you, what's, what's your take on this, right? Where, where do you see us as a nation? Where do you see you, you know, Oregon as a state um, um, when it comes to kind of the tough on crime politics? Would be one way to say it, or when it comes to criminal justice reform, right? The positive way to say it. What, what do you think is the state of affairs right now? Uh, well, I have to say this was an incredibly challenging election cycle uh, across the entire country. Um, to be upfront with all of you, uh, the impact of the election hasn't changed my uh, thinking around clemencies for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I know it's much easier to stoke fear and anger uh, than it is to build compassion and understanding and healing in our communities to create a beloved community. Um, and uh, that doesn't make it right, but it's going to continue to happen unless we all fight back. And it's going to take all of us working together to make that happen. The good news is, uh, at least in Oregon, uh, that voters came down on the side of justice. Uh, I know you all think that Oregon is a uh, bastion of progressive public policy, but that has not been true. I mean, we kick New Jersey's you-know-what and environmental policy <laughs> and voter access but it is certainly not true around criminal justice policy. Um, I was a legislator in the 90s. It feels like we're somewhere back in the 90s with what happened this election cycle, and I don't think 
any of us want to go back there. I believe we have evolved. Uh, but in Oregon, we passed at least three get tough on crime ballot measures. And we're still seeing the ramifications of those ballot measures. Uh, we have 14,000 people behind bars in a population of 4.2 million people. We are the same uh, incarcerated population as the state of Washington, just to our north. They are double the population that we are. They're about 7.8 million people. Um, but, you know, and gubernatorial races can be very close in Oregon, having lived through two of them and, and watched my predecessors live through them as well. But um, what we do know uh, is that we can make a difference. And one of my proudest bills to sign was Senate Bill 1008, which provided a second look uh, for our juveniles convicted of ballot measure 11 crime, the get one of the get tough on crime measures. And um, I think it is so important uh, that we make strides where we can make them. And I consider my category of uh, commutations under uh, sort of two areas, one the policy side and the other on a case-by-case -case basis. And Senate Bill 1008 uh, really enabled me to essentially forward uh, 73 uh, folks who were uh, incarcerated as juveniles to the parole board so that they could get a second look. Uh, and so I see that as incredibly important. Um, but I also have uh, adopted uh, commutations on a case-by-case -case basis. And I just want to share one story, um, mindful of uh, Mr. Thompson being here. Uh, this woman's name was Keisha. Is Keisha. She was working three jobs and unfortunately got hooked on meth um, to keep her awake for work. Uh, she planned uh, to go trade her food stamps for meth, uh, but the man she was with shot and killed another man and robbed two people. She didn't enter the home where the murder occurred. She didn't have a gun and obviously did not kill the victim. Um, she's black, she's a lesbian, and she was convicted of an all-white jury of felony murder sentenced to life in prison. To give you a little context, a, a robbery conviction in Oregon is about seven years. The DA in that county did not support her application, but the victim's children did. While incarcerated, she did everything she could. She dealt with her trauma. She got a 3.7 at Portland State University. She graduated with a 3.7. And she engaged in all of the programming that was available to her. And then she shifted her attention to helping others. I granted her clemency after she had already served 18 years in prison. These are the type of people that we are given a second chance. It is an opportunity, I think, um, to save lives and eventually save the world. And we all have to engage with every fiber of our being in this work. And we need to do It's an incredible, it's an incredible example. Um, so, Mr. Thompson, like I said. You didn't, you didn't skip a beat when you, came, when you were finally able to get out of prison and you founded the Michael Thompson Clemency Project. Can you tell us a bit about that project and the type of work that, that you and your team, which I know many of them are here today, are engaged in? Yes. Before I answer that, I just want to say this. I, I warn you, I wasn't no politician. And, uh, and I speak to one heart to another heart. And I try to speak to the conscience of a person. Uh, so I just want to say that in, as far as the uh, Mike Thompson clemency, uh, it's, it's very important to me because uh, God hasn't gave up hope. God hasn't given up hope. Okay, like, for example, I'm telling you how they look at, at, at this when the priest turned red. They look at it that they vote don't count for the 
politicians don't care. Uh, they're a burden on the taxpayers. And the taxpayers don't care, but people don't care. So they said, hell with it. And then when they get out, they feel nobody cared about them. They don't give a damn about uh, the people out there in the street. And I know you may look at it and say, well, that's a little too cold. That's a little too cold. So that's the way life is. Life in turn cold. People is not the same as when I grew up. When I was little. And cold blooded. And I'm looking at these little young people. Young people picking up guns to solve their problems. They used to fight it out. Knuckle it up, you know, but and I'm just saying, I was wondering who is who is doing their thinking? Everybody seemed like they turned their head to what's really happening. Look at all this violence. This is history violence. You know, it ain't never been this much violence. You know, when I go to Walmart or anything, I gotta be looking to see is there a mass killer up in there, you know, because you never know where it's gonna happen at. You know, you can be going to the store and then next thing you know, you lose your life. Your whole family lose their life. So my thing is, on the clemency, is I just want to help guys, you know what I'm saying, they want to help themselves. I'm not telling you, I'm not asking you to help me help get some old guys out that that, that, that are called a problem to society or be a problem to society. I'm not asking for that. I'm telling you, I know these people. I did 25 years with them. Like I said, everybody in prison is not bad. You can't throw everybody in one basket. You can't do that. And that's the reason why I'm thankful. If I didn't have people like Cresco Lab helping me, I can help my kids. I would be in the same boat as a lot of people. But my thing is to come here, plead with you. Help me so I can help them that don't have a voice. I'm their voice. Thank you. Attorney General Plotkin, um, you know, we have a lot of pride in New Jersey including in the fact, uh, Amol Sinha, the executive director of the ACLU of New Jersey, just spoke to my class earlier today, and he rightfully said that New Jersey is the leading state in the nation when it comes to decarceration, right? Um, we've seen about a 33% reduction in the prison population just in the last year. A lot of it is because of innovative policies implemented by the governor's office, your office, um, and it's fair to say that New Jersey is a leader. At the same time, as I know that you're, you're very aware of, because I know you're, you care deeply about this issue, New Jersey also has a distinction of having um, the highest racial disparities in its prison population in the nation, with black people incarcerated at a rate that is 12 and a half times that of white people. While New Jersey has one of the lowest incarceration rates in the country, in fact, the lowest, it has the most extreme racial disparities in the nation. So can you talk about that? I know you care deeply about this issue. Can you talk about what can your office do to address this and any thoughts on this matter? Yeah, um, I'll say categorically, the discrepancies are completely <laughs> unacceptable. Um, and, you know, they, uh, they, of course, they, they bother me and they bother my team and everybody who works on these issues. And that's why I think we've spent so much time um, trying to address them. Um, and it dovetails, you know, I believe in data, good, bad, or ugly. I want to know what the data says. And I think 
particularly in the context of criminal justice, we need to be making decisions based on actual facts. I know that sounds like a crazy idea today, um, <laughs> but the data is really important. And if you're not looking at certain types of data, you're going to make decisions that profoundly affect classes of people in our society. And you may not even be doing it intentionally. And we are, and to dovetails a little bit with the question you raised to the governor, because we are in one of those moments right now. I really believe that. Um, oh, governor, I am very fortunate to not be elected. Um, but I, I've, and I, I mean that, having spent a decent amount of time with folks who are elected and um, continue to work with them and talk to my colleagues who are elected. Um, we're in a moment right now, and I'm going to get to your question in a second, Udi, that if we ignore realities on the ground, we very well could make the same mistakes that were made a couple of decades ago and that you're seeing right next to me the impact that those decisions can have decades later. And so the reality in New Jersey right now is that shootings are down 25%. They're down in every one of our major cities by double digit percent. I was in Trenton this morning at an event. They're down 44% in the state capital. Auto thefts, which have become a major topic of conversation here, and rightfully so, there were a, they did spike for a period of time, are back down over the past few months below five-year trend levels, back down below we were before the pandemic. And so for everyone in the room, the people listen to, as I'm now one of those people, we have to say that because otherwise the reaction is going to be so swift in the other direction that uh, we could make some seriously bad decisions that will profoundly, have, at the macro level with people who aren't thinking about how it's going to affect people on the ground and how it's going to affect people's lives in ways that in many ways are not going to be reparable. Um, and so when it gets to the, the issue that you raised is a, pro, is a result of decisions that had, were made over time that had that effect. Um, and we have seen a significant reduction in our um, incarcerated population in the state without, I would argue, an increase in crime that results. Um, and that's true at every level. Uh, our decrease in juvenile, detained juvenile population, I mentioned the history here, started in 2004 with the implementation of the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. We partnered with the Casey Foundation. I, still, I think we're still the only state in the country that's a model state for the Casey Foundation. Um, we're about to put out a report. My team member, Senior Counsel Derek Daly is here, who works on JJC. We're about to put out a report for this year. Every year we publish our data. When you compare to where we are today in juveniles incarcerated in New Jersey to where we were in 2003, we're down about 75%. Um, Easy. And 90... That, that's good, but again, let's look at the data. 90% of that reduction is people of color. And so the gap is still way too wide in terms of the rate of incarceration for particularly black and brown communities versus white. But that number, when we look at the data, it's shrinking. And you know, we've done other things. I just was in a meeting yesterday. We looked at making sure that the policies we're doing, even in real time, are having um, the appropriate racial impact. And there was a policy we were discussing yesterday that was well-intentioned. But when we looked, this is the team that's been implementing these progressive reforms. When we looked at the racial impact, we were shocked that it was having a racially disparate impact on black communities. It was for some very um, not so obvious, but totally innocuous reasons. And when we flipped that policy, the parity immediately um, uh, became. And it's, it's about where kids are, when they are in detention, where they're, de where they're placed. And now black and brown kids are placed much closer to home, the few that are detained, which we know has better impact on their, on their lives. Um, and then the other decarcer efforts that we've done over the past few years, a lot of them were born out of COVID, um, but COVID was a disruption to a lot of systems, um, but a lot weren't. Uh, you know, I keep going back to the partnerships. 2017, a Republican governor partnered with the ACLU, Democratic legislators, and a judiciary and implemented I think the best bail reform system in the country and one that we should continue to defend. Are there a, 
occasions where we have to revisit things? Absolutely, and we do. We get around the table, and ACLU is at that table with us um, where we talk about changes that need to be made. But bail reform has had a significant impact in reducing the um, number of people in our um, county jails. And uh, same with marijuana. Um, when it, we had a criminal sentencing and disposition commission that the governor stood up, one of his very first acts, um, and we took a hard look at the entire criminal code. And there was a series of recommendations made in 2019, and the commission's work is ongoing and make, continuing to make really important recommendations. Um, but one of the recommendations was an elimination of mandatory minimums for nonviolent drug and property offenses. Um, supported, by the way, by law enforcement and the advocacy community. And I think that's a lesson here for why New Jersey has been successful. We don't always go 100% of where we'd want to go, but when we lock arms and we do it together, when we have moments like this, there, I'm not saying there's no calls, but there are more people in communities that you might not expect in many other states, including in the law enforcement community, who are willing to say, no, this is a good thing. We shouldn't backslide. And so uh, the last thing I'll mention is on the mandatory minimums, 2019, they make this recommendation for legislation to eliminate these mandatory minimums in the legislature for reasons that are probably not worth getting into here, uh, doesn't do it. So in the AG's office, we issued a directive that did two things. One, it prospectively, again, I have the authority to direct all the prosecutors in the state. So we prospectively waived those mandatory minimums for those offenses, which means thousands of people that are going through the system now and in the future will not have a mandatory minimum. Um, but then we also went back and for a, a certain class of, uh, of people who were incarcerated uh, on certain offenses, um, we went in and made applications to um, revise those sentences. Uh, I don't have clemency authority, so I can't speak to that, but we do have the ability um, uh, when appropriate to go in and seek to modify sentences, and we did that for over 250 people who were serving um, nonviolent drug and property mandatory minimum sentences, and they were ultimately either released or in the process of completing their shortened sentence. So there's a lot we can do, but I think my key takeaway on all of this is you have to look at the data. And if you're in a position where you're making these decisions, and I, I know the governor would agree, especially when we're thinking about decisions that aren't going to be known what impact they'll have for decades, we have to make sure we're being very intentional about the decisions we're making um, because otherwise we will make mistakes that result in the widest racial gap of incarcerated individuals in the country. And I think that that's something nobody in New Jersey would say they want. Thank you. And I gotta say, I'm looking at wearing my professor hat for a second. I'm looking at a lot of the juniors in the room right now who are starting to think about their thesis um, project. I think, I think looking at the fact that New Jersey does have such a strong attorney general's office and a very centralized criminal legal system opposite of pretty much every other state, maybe with like the exception of Connecticut, what impact that has on your ability to implement reforms, which would be positive. Then also the fact that you're unelected, right? That the uh, prosecutors are unelected. Um, what impact does that have? Is there an accountability? So I think it's a fascinating, but, but, but I think there's no question that the New Jersey has been in the lead on both its juvenile justice reform and legal reform. But, in New Jersey. All right, there you go. We, we brought you in. We really, this is kind of, you know, East Coast versus West Coast. Welcome to well, my home, house. We have home turf here. This isn't really uh, home fair. Home turf advantage. <laughs> um, all right, so Governor Brown, I mean, I loved the Attorney General's focus on data, but that assumes that people are rational and follow data. And it's not exactly the world that we live in. And I think that is like particularly true on the issue of clemency, right? And you know, when I talk to governors, when I talk to policymakers, so much of the fear that prevents a governor, even the most well-intentioned one, from using their power of clemency is that worst case scenario, right? That one person who may commit another crime um, that spoils it, or for lack of a better term, for you know, the hundreds of others. How do you deal with that, right? Like, you know, what role should that play in your decision making, if any? Um, and what do you say to people who think that that's a risk that is too high to take? So I'll just say two things. Uh, public safety and the fear-mongering that's happening around get tough on crime policies are really two different things. 
and I talked a little bit about the fear mongering in my last comments. Um, I, for me, in terms of granting these commutations, the most important criteria is public safety. Uh, and that has to be at the forefront of executives and clemency and parole boards' uh, minds, collective minds, as they make these decisions. But there are also, frankly, other factors that I take into account. Secondly, making sure that victims have an opportunity to be heard and, and provide input. And then uh, to look at the individual themselves. And I think this is also key. Um, have they been held accountable? And do they accept, uh, accept responsibility for their actions? Have they demonstrated rehabilitation? And the work that is happening behind bars uh, in our systems across the United States. Some of it is truly extraordinary. What our adults in custody, what our youth in custody are doing. Um, to what extent uh, have they not only dealt with their past trauma, been through treatment, sex offender treatment, uh, drug and alcohol treatment, uh, gotten access to education, all of those pieces. And then the third piece for me as I look at individuals is what they do to help others. I spoke about Keisha earlier. What stood out to me about her case was as soon as she was done getting her house in order, she went and helped others. And that's true in case after case that I have seen. And I, I talked about my case by case analysis. One of the young people, um, sentence I commuted. Uh, Mulu, he came in, um, he left, he came in uh, with drug and alcohol issues. He got the treatment that he needed. And then now he is back in his community providing those desperately needed treatment and services uh, in a very culturally responsive way uh, that's also trauma informed. It's extraordinary. And I can tell you case after case of folks who are back in their community, not all of them obviously doing treatment, support and services, but many other ways to give back. And so I think it's incredibly important. I have to echo what the Attorney General said about data. When I was in the legislature in the 90s, we knew, the RAND Corporation said, you know, what did it cost today to put a person in behind bars? You could take that money and front load it into our early childhood education and make sure that our families have the support and services that our children have, what they need. Um, you can close your uh, racial uh, opportunity gaps. You can lift up families in poverty. Uh, you can help our rural communities thrive by making those types of investments. But we need more uh, non-traditional validators like attorneys general, uh, I don't think it's uh, unusual. I, I think it's unusual to have an attorney general participate in a panel like this. Uh, we need folks like uh, Coke Industries, who spoke uh, eloquently at a National Governors Association a couple years ago about the importance of giving people second chances. We need conservatives, and we need people of faith to stand up. Um, I just, uh, it's, it's a really tough row to hoe. I have to put on my metal underpants on a regular basis. <laughs> but it's incredibly important because these are the kinds of lives that we are changing. And it's going to take all of us. Thank you. So many reactions. First of all, we have someone here from the, who used to work at the Rand Corporation who, you know, did a lot. So <laughs> I love the shout out there. Um, um, and, and, and I love that you mentioned also the, you know, we're actually, we're going to plan an event here at SPIA that also brings a lot of the, the conservatives movement around criminal justice reform to campus because I have been really impressed. And even today, literally today in D.C., there are conservative organizations that are lobbying um, the Senate on the Equal Act is a bill that's pending before the Senate that has 11 Republican co-sponsors. That and would going to need your support. That would end once and for all the sentencing disparities between crack and powder cocaine, which is one of the worst vestiges 
of the height of the racist war on drugs that has devastated many lives and, and you know, could potentially pass this year. And there are many conservative Republicans that actually support it. And it's been this breath of fresh air in, in, in a country that is polarized on every other um, um, issue. But Attorney General, we're going to go back to you and then Mr. Thompson, I want to give you the last word. But Attorney General Placken, we talked a lot about criminal justice reform, but I want to actually for a second talk about specifically about police reform. Because I actually think that is what, you know, I talk to my students a lot about, there, there's such an incredible movement here at Princeton of students who are passionate about ending mass incarceration or passionate about criminal justice reform. And I ask them, and, you know, where did you get this passion from? And, you know, for so many of them, it is, right? You know, seeing, you know, black men in particular being killed by the police and being part of the George Floyd protests and uh, having this awakening. And I would say the, for, the, for, for the, the younger generation, this is the issue for them. Um, and it's incredibly inspiring. So it would feel weird not to talk about police reform and specifically about some of the program that your office has done, particularly around kind of first responder models. And you recently launched a program called Arrive Together, which pairs law enforcement with mental health professionals um, to be those first responders. So can you talk about that program and what impact that has had on the use of force? Um, my last word, I just want to thank you again for, for having us. This is a really great discussion. Um, and I want to underscore something the governor said because it relates to this. Public safety is my first concern. And I'm the one who gets the calls late at night about a bad shooting. I'm, it has to respond. And I, I see more victims than most people in a, in a month, unfortunately, most people will um, see in, in their lives. And that matters to me because when we talk about public safety, so often these conversations, it happen in silos where we say, okay, well, public safety is here and police reform or criminal justice reform is here. Oh, like we, we shouldn't cede that ground because I think New Jersey has been a leader in police reform and in criminal justice reform, and we're one of the safest states in the country. We have one of the lowest rates of gun violence in America. And that's not an, an accident. When people trust law enforcement, they report crimes before they happen. They're, they're willing to serve as witnesses. They're willing to help us do our jobs because communities want to be safe too, you know, including black and brown communities. And so when I talk about this, I really want to make it clear, and I think it's important for everyone, we shouldn't give up that argument because states that have been progressive on police reform and criminal justice reform are safer than states that have not. And that's, again, going back to the data, that's also empirically true. Um, but we've taken a number of steps here. And again, I'm inheriting a lot of great work, um, but uh, you know, we updated our use of po post-George Floyd, we updated our use of force policy um, through a comprehensive effort. Um, my predecessor, uh, Gerbeer Graywall, led, led that. Um, and uh, we've done a number of other steps, uh, including, as you mentioned, launching a program that I'm very excited about uh, called Arrive Together. Now, in New Jersey, every single use of force is reported to us within 24 hours, and we put it publicly available. Um, the ACLU here, I will say there's still room for us to go on <laughs> transparency generally. But we're pretty good on a number of measures, so much so that the White House uh, modeled their recent directive to uh, federal law enforcement. I was privileged to be invited on the two-year anniversary of Georgia. And I saw you there. I did see UD there, but UD, you're everywhere, so that doesn't really count. Um, uh, you know, so, but we put this data out so the public can see it. And uh, so we know what's driving uses of force. And we know that the overwhelming majority of these cases are cases that involve individuals who are suffering from mental health or emotional distress. And so, we know that a lot of, in the past, a lot of these individuals would get arrested. Sometimes they'd get arrested dozens of times. Sometimes they get arrested dozens of times in a month. Um, and the impact of that was that we ended up in, in jail. And so, or they end up getting hurt by law enforcement, or sometimes they end up hurting law enforcement. And the cumulative impact is that, is that trust gets broken down between law enforcement and the community. I think there's nothing more devastating to community police relations than when we have a bad incident of use of force. And so that one incident undermines all of the other work that the 38,000 really incredible law enforcement officers are doing throughout the state. 
And so Arrive Together essentially says we're going to respond to those calls differently. We're going to bring together an unmarked car with a plainclothes officer and a mental health professional together. Um, that's where the pun comes from. I could tell you what Arrive stands for, but it's, it's a square peg round hole thing. We really, uh, um, you know, we were, it was a branding thing, but it works. Um, and the program works. So we've helped through this program hundreds of people now and effectively have had no uses of force. The very few instances of uses of force have been strictly in connection with transporting an individual to mental health treatment. We've had no arrests. Um, and that's amazing because when I read those logs, you know, it's hard to know what would have happened on any one of those calls. But you could imagine how a call of severe mental health or emotional distress that previously could have resulted in an officer using force, potentially even using a weapon, um, now is resulting in that individual being transported or diverted to appropriate treatment, not just dropped off at the emergency room and said, we'll see you next time. Um, and I'll give you one specific example of that. There was a woman who uh, had been released from treatment, was at home at her brother's house. She was having a psychiatric episode. Brother called 911, said it was a psychiatric episode. We deployed an ARRIVE team. And... Uh, when the officer and the mental health professional showed up, the woman said, I don't know why, he was plain clothes, but he's still, you know, visibly an officer, said, I don't know why he's here, I don't trust police. And so the officer, and I commend this state trooper, did what we trained. We train every officer in the state now. Every, in fact, every officer has been trained on de-escalation and bystander intervention. And the officer de-escalated, he took a step back, he made sure the scene was secure, and basically let the mental health professional take the lead. And she got that woman to treatment without incident. Again, don't know what happens if that officer is there by himself, but you could imagine what, what could happen. And so I think this is a program that I'm hopeful next year at this time. We're talking about how it's statewide in all 21 counties and seven days a week. We're, we're working towards that. The governor and the legislature have been tremendously supportive on top of a whole host of other things, including, I think, standing up the strongest police licensing program in the country, um, which over the next year we'll be implementing um, that will for finally say if you're a member of a hate group or you can't pass a psychiatric evaluation that just like I can't be a lawyer or you can't be a so social worker or a hairdresser, um, you also can't be a, a police officer. And that again helps raise confidence in law enforcement because most law enforcement officers aren't using force when they shouldn't. Most law enforcement officers aren't members of hate groups. But when some are, it destroys that trust. So all of that is work that is ongoing, but is incredibly important, and I'm very encouraged by it. So many great thesis projects. Um, I will have to say one shout out here to the great state of Oregon, where it does be New Jersey, because I was, I was uh, whispering in the governor's ear, um, Oregon has been a pioneer on alternative first responder models, and that's the CAHOOTS program out of Eugene, Oregon, which I think is something like 20 years old at this point, somewhere around that, and has respond, response to tens of thousands of 911 calls every single year, um, deploys um, mental health professionals and violence de-escalators, and has had great successes. So we have models. We have models of an alternative, and I'm so excited for this New Jersey program. OK, before I'm going to turn it over to um, Cynthia Roseberry, um, Mr. Thompson, we, you, you know, we, we're sitting here in a room full of um, students um, who are passionate on these issues. Um, can you, and we're sitting here in a room with a governor, right? And, and we are going to make sure that, you know, we bring this message to other governors. So can you kind of share with us, both for the students, like if you're committed about, in, in, committed to these issues, what, what, what's the world that you want them to work towards? And can you ask governors, you know, what's the world that you want them to help build for all of us? Well, I just want the governor, I just want all the governors to be real. You know, because the uh, only thing they got to do is just be real. And uh, they'll find the answer within themselves. Um, see, it's so it's so much politics being played today. You know, I hate, I know I sound like a broke record, but 
you know, I had to sit back in the cell. That's really why I stopped from anyone coming to see me for over 20 years. I didn't receive a visit for over 20 years. And the reason why I didn't want to receive no visit because I got tired of people lying to me. And I don't like liars. So I just stopped my visit. You know, that's the way the world is out there. They're going to come up here and they lie to me. So I just stopped my visit. And so primary correction thought I was crazy. So they uh, sent me to a psychiatrist. Let me tell psychiatrists and uh, psychiatrists say, well, there's nothing wrong with him. This man got a lot of pride uh, principles about himself. He just don't want, he don't want nobody to bother him with a bunch of lies and promises. And that's where I'm at right now. I don't, I'm not here to, to hear a bunch of promises. You know, I'm here to, to ask you, can you help me? Or can I help you? That's what I'm here for. And, you know, you got to understand, I sat back for many years and watched them just shackle, they shackle a prisoner up. They shackle him up and then take, his center, take him up to the control center or the health care. And then they put a dog leech on him. Almost lost my school. Uh, a dog leech. A dog leech. A real dog leech. Then they take him to look in the mirror. And what do he see when he look in the mirror after you walk me with a dog leech? And I used to step back and look at that. And I used to say to myself, one day, it's going to come back and haunt them. Because when I was leaving the prison, all I could hear in my head was Miko. He called me Miko in prison. They go out there and tell the truth. Man, don't forget about us. That's all I kept hearing. Don't forget about us. Tell the truth. Well, don't, don't forget about us. That's what I've been doing. Telling the truth. A lot of people will tell you a bunch of things and make themselves sound good. Sound good. It's not the truth. And what I... You don't know. Uh, them guys don't have a lot of time. Like you got all day to do everything you want to do and everything. It's hurting in there. I'm talking to ones that deserve a second chance. They hurt him in there. And they know what they did wrong and, and they feel sorry. They're sorry for it. But you got to give them another chance like you gave me. Now look at me. I'm not who they say I was. But they can take a pencil and make you look like a real bad person. They can create this animal, this monster, just with a flick of a pencil. But my thing is, I just want you to go home. Talk to your conscience. Look in the mirror. Mirror yourself. And just see where your conscience is at. Because what happened to America? America's justice system is broken. It's broken. I know Bernie might not agree with me. Is we still work. Works for who? So I just want 
you just remember my voice. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna shift gears now, um, and I'm gonna hand over the podium to Cynthia Roseberry. And it is such an honor and a privilege to see Cynthia. Cynthia is someone who I've known for a few years, and I had the honor of being able to hire you um, <laughs> in 2019. But Cynthia is, is just a rock star. Um, um, and I'm her biggest fan. You know, her resume is long, but let me give you some highlights and embarrass you a bit. She's been the head of a federal defender's office in, in, in the state of Georgia, not an easy place to be a federal defender. We have, you know, some Georgians here with us. Um, she's been a law professor. She was the head of President Obama's clemency initiative um, um, and actually put so many of these ideas into action. And right now she is the head of the Justice Division of the ACLU, which is the best job in the world, <laughs> um, um, where she leads the ACLU's criminal justice reform advocacy efforts. And we're also going to welcome Nicole to come up. And Nicole is someone who I first met, oh man, I want to say like four years ago, maybe even five years ago, in a barbecue restaurant in Austin, Texas. Um, and immediately fell in love with both Nicole and Lewis, who's someone you're, you're about to hear more about. And Nicole is an incredibly talented person. I follow you closely on Facebook and all your amazing designs and art. And it's such an honor and a privilege to have you here with us today. So I'm going to hand it over to both of you. I'll be brief. But first and foremost, thank you to all of you for taking time to come out here, taking time out of your busy schedules to be in attendance today. Thank you to our hosts um, and the incredible team here at Princeton University at the School of Public and International Affairs. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to my former colleague and boss, Udi Ofer, uh, for having us here and keeping the connection. Thank you to Tara Stutzman for putting this all together for us. It's moments like this when we come together to discuss policy issues, to listen to each other, to learn from one another, that we gain knowledge and tools that we need to better serve. Um, I'd like to thank you also, Governor Brown, for your courageous work. Uh, Mr. Thompson, thank you for your courage as well. And Attorney General Placken, for being here today to discuss these important issues. In 2020, the American Civil Liberties Union launched the Redemption Campaign, and that's a nationwide effort to liberate 50,000 people from federal and state prisons by encouraging the president and governors to exercise their constitutional clemency authorities in transformational ways like categorical clemency. Through this campaign, we work to provide clemency for groups of people who are unjustifiably in prison, people serving time for acts that are no longer illegal, for example, or people who convicted of a, an offense who would be better served by social support and treatment, and people who are incarcerated for technical probation or parole violations, and older people. Uh, there's never a more pressing moment than now to have a conversation as we grapple with what mass incarceration has done to communities and particularly black and brown communities, as you can see, there is a disparate impact and treatment, shameless plug. As we pointed out in our ACLU report in 2020, a tale of two countries racially targeted arrests in the era of marijuana reform. And it's through this lens that we honor the work of our colleagues and redemption campaign strategist, Lewis Conway, who made his transition in August. It is with great honor that I announce the creation of the Lewis Conway Jr. Leadership in Clemency Award. And it's so appropriate, Nicole, that you are here with us for that. Um, this award is for a champion who gives a second chance and an opportunity for re-entry. Lewis was amazing. I, I mean, 
People say amazing as a throwaway word, and I mean amazing like Marvel Comics amazing. That's how I mean amazing. Lewis was the first formerly incarcerated person to be on a ballot in a bid for the Austin City Council. Just think about what that means, right? He was a notable advocate in Texas for the rights and representation of formerly incarcerated people. He was a gifted storyteller. He trained other people to tell their stories. He hosted town hall for us. He gave guest lectures. He ran some of our campaigns in the use of clemency. And he was an endlessly optimistic person. Nicole, what did he say? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. I remember on Mondays, Lewis would greet me by saying, Happy Monday. Who says Happy Monday? <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Conway Jr. says Happy Monday. Because he said any Monday that he's not in a Texas prison is a happy Monday. You know, the truth about it is our worst days are better than the best days in prison. Right? Um, he and Nicole together were a dynamic team. I hope you do Google the crown adjuster. That's who Nicole is. So this award that we're giving today is an inaugural award in Lewis's honor. It's my pleasure to announce the 2022 recipients of the Lewis Conway Jr. Leadership in Clemency Award. First is Governor Kate Brown. For your historic use of clemency, in the state of Oregon, granting over a thousand commutations and early releases and more than 47,000 pardons, demonstrating a meaningful and lasting commitment to advancing civil rights and liberties through the power of clemency and providing redemption, not just to individuals, but you've granted clemency to re provide redemption to a system, as Udi mentioned, which is equally important. Our laws and courts and authorities are not immune from making mistakes and clemency provides an act of redemption for it as well. For when our laws are unjust or for when a court hands down draconian sentences. So please join me in commending Governor Brown for her work to right these wrongs. I'm also pleased to announce the Lewis Conway Jr. Leadership in Clemency Award goes to Mr. Michael Thompson. Woo! For his leadership in storytelling and advocacy to free others in Michigan's prison after serving 25 years in prison. I don't know about you, but I would not be this decent human being if it were me. I, I, I wouldn't. I couldn't. Uh, but here we have here the model of a man. He's touched many lives and does so knowing the power of our voices to call for freedom for others. The work of advocates is difficult and taxing and oftentimes require relying on sheer perseverance to work towards a future where our criminal legal system serves our communities rather than harms them. In founding the Michael Thompson Clemency Project to aid others who remain behind bars in Michigan, Mr. Thompson volunteered to traverse again what must have been treacherous ground for him, to go back into the belly of the beast, go back into the trauma, to help pull others out, like first responders who run toward the danger to help others. He's brought families of incarcerated people together, has provided the care and attention necessary to the issues of clemency as a means to provide relief to people most in need of relief from unjust sentences. Mr. Thompson, your work and your leadership to raise the voices of others who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated, much in the same way Lewis did. I'm pleased to see that you're doing everything that you can do. I'm pleased to see that in honor of our dear friend and loved one 
and fellow colleague in this work to offer you this award. I know he would be honored to know that you have this award. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Michael. <laughs> The ACLU thanks Governor Brown and Mr. Thompson for their accomplishments. You know, we have a responsibility to correct unjust sentences of the past and to keep people from staying in prison too long. You know, I often in front of a judge said, if we can grasp with the idea that when I have a child, I want my child to feel loved and cared for and associated with good things. If we can understand that, then we must understand that there's a burden on the other side of not having that that shows up in our criminal legal system. And it's up to us to work to make sure that the humanity of everyone who's involved in the system is recognized. Lastly, I hope you'll join us for a reception uh, as we continue this conversation in the Schultz Dining Room, which will begin momentarily. Thank you for being here. I think we have presents for you guys. Okay. Princeton. Oh, more presents? Yes. Wow. Sorry, one is from Michael and the other one is for Okay. Not this, this is for your... Michael, this Michael. is for you from Princeton. No, no, that's their box. That's, oh, that's their the box. box. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. I got something earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Okay. Oh, beautiful, man. Can I get Kevin? Can I get the Oregon Amazing. folks down here for a photo? How you doing? I'm so happy you came. I'm so yes, happy you I guys came. came. So, yes. are you guys gonna stick around for reception? We should Good. stick a little bit for you. Okay. 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 Awesome. We're coming. Awesome. Yes, definitely. I think you yeah. might. Elisa, Professor oh, Kaplan. Oh, oh, yes. Would that be okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh. Hey. Uh, 